Welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise, your favorite baseball history podcast. My name is Jeff. I'm one half the show. Joining me, as always, from the great Pacific Northwest, it is my co-host, Mark A. Johnston. Mark, hello, sir. Hey, Jeff. What's going on, man? I mean, it's uh, it's playoff time. It is. Exciting time if your team exists, but also if your team is in the playoffs. It is. We're going to do something a little bit unique uh, this week. It is playoff time. We got things to talk about that. End of regular season. Shohei Otani. Oh my gosh. Uh, Doubleheader the day after the season ends to get teams in. Pete Rose passing away. But uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're not going to really talk about any of that stuff. This is, I'm going to hijack this show, Mark, because as I mentioned earlier, earlier like two sentences ago my favorite team in not just baseball but all of sports and something that is very important to me no longer exists so we're gonna dedicate this show to my favorite thing of all time which is the oakland athletics i want to say again oakland athletics and this whole show is going to be about the a's so as uh, it should be yeah and i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna get emotional I've had a rough last week for a lot of reasons, but this was kind of the cherry on top was final final home stand, final home game, and then the final games. Were you at the last were were you at the the Sunday game in in Seattle? I I was not. I did not make it. Well, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, too. But let's let's get into it right away here. This is going to be a different segment of BP, but let's get into it. And and I'm going to kind of rearrange what I have on my my run sheet here. I want to talk about, Mark, I want to ask you times that you've cried at a ballpark or because of baseball. Okay. You, I know one of yours. Uh, Because I was with you when it happened, and I don't know if you remember it because I brought this up to you in in a text. But I remember when they retired Ken Griffey Jr.'s number at at T-Mobile or Safeco at that point. I know I looked around because everybody showed up whether they were working that night or not. The control room was pretty crowded. And, you know, myself not being a, a Mariners fan and kind of being removed from it, I looked around during that ceremony. Of, of his number being retired and every single person on that front row had tears in their eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I confess that was a very emotional uh, moment for me, especially when you look back at how Griffey kind of disappeared and left us. And then like the prodigal son came back and uh, gave his all for the Mariners again. And, and it was the, the chance to celebrate one of the greatest players of all time. Yeah, definitely the The best Mariner ever. Absolutely. Griffey Jr. I I also think there's another time that I've seen you well up because I did too. Every damn opening day, that make a wish kid. Oh man. I was going to go there. (laughs) That gets to run around (laughs) the bases. Like they hit a home run in front of an opening day crowd. I, if you've got a dry eye, uh, when that happens, yeah, I think you should check yourself because that's, that's something special that, and I haven't seen that anywhere else. That's something that the Mariners do every opening day. And that's always very emotional. Yeah. It's awesome to see these incredibly brave kids that uh, have gone through so much and all they wanted to do was run the bases. And so they get to in the whole place. I kind of tearing up just thinking about it. Yeah. The whole place, 40 plus thousand fans are screaming. The and players come and greet them at home plate. Like it was a walk off and yep. Oh, boy. It's, uh, that's a great moment every year. Any any other times you've cried because of, I mean, you're a Mariners fan, so I'm guessing you've cried a lot because of baseball. But I mean, <laughs> cried um, in terms of you were just sad or very happy. Well, when the A's won it all in 89. Hmm. Um, I was working for the A's at the time for their minor league affiliate, obviously. And I knew a bunch of those guys and I knew how much it meant to them. And how much it meant to me being a big Oakland fan at the time. And uh, to see them win it all was uh, just a, an amazing feeling because it felt like back then it felt like it was going to always be the Yankees, you know. And uh, to see Oakland pull it off was awesome. I, I got to say, I didn't cry. Uh, I was running around the house. I was so excited. And then I remember I had uh, kind of a, 
a negative reaction, which is completely changed now. But I had a negative reaction when Stu was named MVP because I thought Ricky should have been because he had a great World Series. But the things that Stu did off the field, as well as starting games one and three and winning them both and just being Dave Stewart. But, you know, what he did off the field as well with the earthquake victims, uh, I think is well deserved. And I'm glad he did. Um, Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple here as well. Uh, I was at, what was it, two, three years ago, I guess? Stephen Vogt's final game. Mm, Yes. Uh, And he came up for his final at-bat of his career. He knew, everyone knew he was retiring, and his kids were up, and they did the PA, and they announced him as he walked to the plate, and he acknowledged them. And then he hit a walk-off home run. (laughs) <laughs> and I was jumping up and down and crying as everyone in the stadium was. It was just magical for his final game. Such a, a fan favorite. Yeah, it was uh, a great moment for baseball. Yeah. I mean, his kids, you know, calling him, you know, to the plate and then to win it with a home run. It was just that was that was great. And I'm so glad I was there. I was disappointed. He was supposed to be at fantasy camp last year, but then he went and got a managerial job and leads his team to the central crown and stuff. Cause he, I wanted he to could talk. have been managing your team at fantasy. He camp. could have been. I, cause I really wanted to talk to him about that. The other time I cried, it was not a baseball game, but uh, at in Cooperstown, when my wife and I went for Ricky's hall of fame induction, I knew I was going to cry. Yeah. And I did. Then uh, I want to say the, uh, the all-star game, I think it was like in 99 in Boston when Ted Williams you know, oh, yes. went out to throw out the first pitch and all the players went out with him. And that still gets me whenever I see a replay of that. That yeah, No, that's outstanding. You know, and I, I do have one more, actually. All right. Uh, when Mike Schmidt announced his retirement. Really? Uh, well, he absolutely balled. And you knew he was leaving something that he loved more than anything. And he was doing it because he felt it was the right thing to do. And... Um, just to see him just tear up and, and absolutely lose it because he was leaving his favorite thing for the good of the game in his mind. I thought he could have kept going, but that's just me. And uh, so it was just, it was contagious to see somebody for to somebody who loved baseball that much and was that good at it to see them walk away from it. Um, that one, that one definitely brought tears to my eyes. Well, he saw the writing on the wall that Rick shoe was going to take over. Of course. <laughs> He's like, I've seen that baseball card. That uh, that 87 <laughs> tops card is strong, and I'm a little worried. My final one, and it led to like a five-day just depression, was during the seventh inning stretch of the final A's home game. Mm. The whole final home stand was, was pretty glum. And, you know, they, they, the A's played really well after, I mean, for the season, I got to say, I was very surprised. But especially after the All-Star break, this team played really well. Didn't even finish they in did. last place in the AL West. I mean. No, no, they, they were way better than I thought they would be. Yeah. And the seventh inning stretch, though, the, the broadcast, like I said, I didn't go to any of these games in, in this final homestand. I didn't want to. I'd said my goodbyes, the homestand before. And when I took BP down on the field, I spent some time in, in specific locations on the field that meant something to me, like left field and third base. And so I decided that I was not going to go. Plus, I, you know, I just I don't like crowds. And so I, I knew that there were going to be a lot of people at those games. But during the seventh inning stretch, the broadcast stayed in the stadium and Kara Savoy, who is the in-stadium host, and has been for a long time. She's great. She got to speak freely, and uh, it was it was heartfelt, and really got me. And then Dallas started just kind of going off, and uh, despite the fact that Jenny Kavnar was was calling the game, and I had to sit through that, uh, <laughs> that really really got me. And then after the game, everybody just stayed, and the players did such a great job. Mark Kotze spoke to the crowd, and he had some thoughts uh, that everybody on the A's has been kind of censored. You know, they've censored themselves knowing that the the owner is still going to be the owner, and you've got to kind of 
be political about that. But Dallas, I don't think Dallas is coming back from the interactions I've had with him and the interactions that I've seen on the air. I don't think they're going to bring him back. And I think he knows that, which is awful because he is just great for baseball and great for A's baseball. Ken Korak, I think, is retiring. They've already told Vince Contronio that he's not going to be coming back. It's it's going to be very different, but a lot of people spoke their mind in the studio. Brody Brazil, who I got to know at Fantasy Camp and is a Bay Area guy and a big A's fan and always has been his entire life. He got very emotional. Bip Roberts, who was in the studio that day, got very emotional. Stu got very emotional. It was it's it's that really started a downward trend. And one of the reasons why we did not have a show last week is I just I I had no desire to come on and talk about baseball. Well, it, it was almost out of respect, you know, as well. And I'm assuming people probably knew that that was why we didn't have a show last week. Stu and Ricky both threw out the first pitch in that final home game. Stu bounced his in. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking to him about that. <laughs> and then the final game uh, of the season against the Mariners in Seattle, the Mariners did something great. And I saw somebody said they did a better job of of saying goodbye to the Ace franchise than than John Fisher did. They had Ricky come out and throw out the final first pitch of the season wearing yeah. just I hate anything that has two team jer- logos on it. And I still do. But it was uh, I guess it fit. They had a jersey that was half Mariners, half A's. And he threw out the, the final first pitch. As, yeah, as that was goodbye. awesome. Um, so I am i don't want to talk about Ricky about this because he made some comments about the A's leaving that I thought were atrocious and I was embarrassed by them. So I'm going to I'm going to skip on the Ricky talk in terms of there. We'll talk about him or obviously as we talk more about the A's. I did want to bring this up. This is A's related There's a home run derby going on in. Let's see. This show is debuting on the fourth on the fifth. So that is going to be uh, Saturday. It's presented by Going Yard Baseball, which I don't know. I, I I follow them, I guess, on social media, probably because of this. But they, they say they have their future of baseball entertainment for fans by fans. We'll see about that. But in Sugarland, Texas, which is where the Astros, the Skeeters, the AAA team plays, there's going to be a home run derby. And participating in this de- this derby is Jose Canseco. He's been on on social media calling out people wanting to have a softball home run derby with anybody that'll listen to him. Yeah. So he's finally going to be uh, doing this. Competing against him will be Andrew Jones, Rafael Palmero, let's see Johnny Manziel, quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Josh Reddick, former athletic, former Astro as well. The King of Juco, who you might know, Eric Sims. He's a big guy on on YouTube. There's some other people here that are not baseball players that I am just, I guess, too old to know who they are. Uh, maybe some of our younger viewers might know that. But there are some special guests. John Rocker is going to be throwing BP for these guys. I mean, John Rocker, Jose Canseco, Rafael Palmero. It's like a rogues gallery of... Yeah, I guess. Wow. Of... It's a pay-per-view. I don't know that I'm going to pay to watch this, but I'll probably figure out a way to see it. <laughs> you shouldn't uh, say that. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it. I'm just saying I'll probably right. figure out a way to see it. Uh, I guess there's going to be some AEW wrestlers uh, are involved in this as well. But uh, there you go. There's if you're if you're interested. Let's see debuts for October 4th. Like I said, we're only going to do A's things today. So nobody from the A's made their debut on October 4th. A couple of notables played their final game today, October 4th. First of all, in 2023, Josh Donaldson. Okay. A great player. Talked his way out of Oakland. You know, we're out as welcome here. But I think A's fans always liked him because of freaking uh, Manny Machado. (laughs) Yes. The, the fight that I don't know what Machado. I I've I've not liked Manny Machado ever since then when he was on Baltimore. Also uh, in 2022, Kurt Suzuki played his final game. A longtime Oakland Athletics pitcher, uh, pitcher catcher. That's all I'm going to say about him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Dan Heron played his final game today. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, now I believe he was traded. He came over for Oakland for Mark Mulder. 
So that was a big deal when that happened because Mulder was, you know, a very good pitcher still yes. at that oh, point. Yeah. And uh, that was another one of those, oh, he's too good. He's, you know, he's leaving now type right. of things. 2009, Jermaine Dye played his final game. Obviously, you don't think of him as a, well, I do, but I guess most people think of him as a white soccer royal. But, you know, there you go. Nomar Garcia Parra, 2009, played a season with the A's, so. There you go. Kiko Calero, 2009. He came over in that that deal for Dan Heron from the Cardinals as well. Uh, Willie Randolph, 1994, or, uh, 1992, uh, played his final game. He played uh, just a season, I think, here. Uh, Jamie Quirk. Jamie uh, Minute Quirk. Oh, that's good. That's a good one. Uh, catcher for the A's, the Royals. Uh, he coached for the A's for quite a while as well. 1992, love this. Carney Lansford, my favorite third baseman of all time for the Oakland Athletics. I would mention Juan Berenguer simply because, you know, of his great musical career, but he never played for the A's. I'll just leave it at that. But those are some of the A's players that played their final games. And I guess I'll mention this, 1987 Reggie Jackson. I don't know, okay. I guess maybe somebody's heard of him. <laughs> he obviously played for the A's and came up with the A's, and we'll talk about him in a little while. But, Mark, that's going to do it for our BP segment here. Let's go on and uh, get right into it. There's no grounds crew coming out to do stuff because the, uh, the Coliseum has already been stripped of just about anything that says Oakland Athletics on it. Like the tarps with the retired numbers are already been taken off. Everything on the outside of the building that says Oakland Athletics has been removed. It's all gone. I drove past it this morning, as a matter of fact, and it is all gone. So, wow. Tough, tough stuff for me. But uh, let's talk about the history of the A's, the Oakland A's. So I'm not going to talk about the Philadelphia Athletics. I'm certainly going to not talk about anything in the future. But let's talk about the the Oakland Athletics and their history in the Bay Area. First of all, let's talk about world series uh back to back to back world series yeah that, well, that's one of the great feats of, of any team uh, i mean you don't even have back to back world series winners that much anymore no but let alone three in a row the only team to do it since then was the yankees in 98 99 and 2000 in fact the uh, only other teams to win that many three or more world series in a row are the athletics and the yankees Yankees won it five times in a row. <laughs> Boy, if, if you don't like the Yankees, well, I mean, just having them win it from 1949 to 1953, that must have been fun. They also won it th- uh, four times in a row in 1936 through 1939. Overall, the A's had four World Series titles in Oakland, six American League pennants, 17 AL West titles, and won a wild card playoff berth four times while here in Oakland. Ricky Henderson. Obviously, we're going to talk about Ricky Henderson, obviously my favorite player of all time on my favorite team of all time. He's just one of the all-time greatest players. Yeah, I I legitimately think, and, and I will ponder on this often, is was Ricky Henderson a top 10 all-time player in baseball? And I try to do it without my personal bias about him. And every time I do it, I come to the conclusion that I think he's one of the 10 greatest baseball players of all time. That's certainly arguable. Absolutely. It, arguments against him being a top 10 all time player are, they'd be hard to defend in my mind. And, and again, I, I try to not be biased, uh, even though I think a little bit creeps in. But uh, Ricky Henderson, 1991, I have a lot of memories of Ricky Henderson, but 1991, Ricky breaks, Lou break. Lou Brock's all-time stolen record against the Yankees. Behind a three, a one-nothing deficit. Ricky goes, a pitch pick, and he's going to have it. He does. Ricky Henderson, no contest, steals third base, jerks the bag from its moorings, and holds it aloft, representing number 939. So uh, we're not going to go into the speech afterwards, uh, <laughs> which is not as bad as people make it out to be. They kind of clip it. But uh, well, when you know what he was trying to say. Yeah. And if you listen to the whole thing in context and if you know how important Muhammad Ali was to, to Ricky Henderson. But it took a couple of tries. Everybody knew anytime he was on base, he was going to, you know. He, he needed one more stolen base, so yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a hard stolen base, but he stole third against the Yankees. 
he would go on to steal 467 more bases after that. That's almost 33% of his career steals were after breaking the all-time record. Wow. That is shattering it. And one of those records that I just don't see anybody breaking, even with the the rules to, to help stolen bases these days. That's just one of those. That Cal Ripken, you know, I, I just don't, I don't see those kind of things being breaking, breaking, those kind of things being broken. Ricky is the face of the Oakland A's too. From He's from Oakland. He was acquired by the A's five different times in his career, wearing an A's cap in the Hall of Fame. His number was retired. I have to assume that they will continue to do that. But the field at the Coliseum also called the Ricky Henderson Field. And he still lives here in the Bay Area. When you think of Oakland athletics, I think that's the only name that can can pop up first for anybody. Let's get on to the 1989 World Series. Before we get to 89, how about 88? Uh, A's made the World Series three years in a row. They didn't win it three years in a row, unfortunately, at this point. But 88 was, of course, memorable for the first walk-off in Game 1. Kirk Gibson hobbles to the plate, takes Dennis Eckersley deep, and uh, the losing pitcher walking off the field, dejected, is the way that Eck interpreted a walk-off. The Dodgers would go on to win the Series 4-1. to The next season, the A's dominated again, and come the trade deadline, they weren't going to stand pat. A day that literally changed my life, they reacquired Ricky Henderson. (laughs) That had to have been, like, just an amazing feeling. I I think I've told this story before, but this is 1989. There's no social media. There's no internet. And I I pulled up to a friend's house, and I remember I was wearing a Yankees hat because I I was rooting for the Yankees because that's where Ricky was playing at the time. And uh, I go up and knock on his door because we're going to hang out. And he goes, did you hear? And I'm like, what? He's like, Ricky got traded to the A's. And so we jumped in the car and I went and bought a new A's hat. (laughs) Of course, absolutely. But he led them to the World Series, blowing through the Blue Jays in the ALCS. Ricky was named MVP. The Battle of the Bay, of course, interrupted by the awful Loma Prieta earthquake. And then the A's swept the Giants with my guy Stu being named MVP, and the Giants can just suck it because they're part of the reason that the A's are leaving. The next year, Ricky would own the AL and be named American League MVP. But we won't talk about the World Series that year. No, either. let's leave that one alone. Yeah, three years in a row, but they, at least they got one. I have seen yes. my team win a World Series, which some people can't, Cleveland. <laughs> I don't. Some they, people have not. There's got to be people alive that saw Cleveland's last World Series win, right? We'll Not necessarily. I don't, yeah. Well, when was it? It was 19, I want to say 1947. I'm just thinking the last time the Mariners won, it was, um, man, I'm going to be thinking for a while. <laughs> 1948, I was one year off. So, yeah, there's clearly people that are alive, you know, when the when Cleveland last won a World Series. But that's a long time. But, yeah, we won't talk about teams that haven't won the world series uh this is a great one this is a fun one the streak in 2002 20 wins in a row yes Uh, the white Sox. i don't i don't did they have 20 wins at the all-star break i'm sure they did but i you know it's it's close but it's just some incredible games especially down the stretch of the, the the streak august 12th the a's lost to the blue jays two to one they were four and a half games behind the mariners in the American League West and trailed the Red Sox and Angels for the AL wild card. They had shown signs of being a pretty good team. They'd won 16 of 17 games at one point in June, which is pretty darn good. Even if that's just two eight game winning streaks, I mean, 16 out of 17, you'll take that any day of the week. After that loss to the Jays, though, Oakland beat Toronto the next night and again the following afternoon. Then they hosted the White Sox and swept three from the White Sox. Then they took the show on the road, sweeping Cleveland, Detroit, and Kansas City. Then they come home. They take the first two games from the twin. From the twin. They take the first two games from the twins, running the streak to 16 straight wins. Incredible. Win 17 was exciting against the twins. The A's scored early and led the entire game until the top of the eighth when Dustin Moore and Torrey Hunter drove in runs to tie the game before Jermaine Dye and Eric Chavez drove in runs in the bottom of the eighth and then they held on in the ninth to run the win streak to 17. 
The next day, the A's again allowed the Twins to take the lead late with a three-run ninth inning on three solo shots. But in the uh, the bottom of the ninth, Miguel Tejada comes up with two runners on, and this happened. Velarde, next running for Ramon Hernandez. He would tie the game. Durham at first, the winning run. Tejada to left field. Well struck. Miguel Tejada has done it. Miguel Tejada has had a three-run walk-off homer to win the game. 18 in a row. Bill King, by the way, on these calls, I've made sure to go, and if, if Bill King makes an A's call, I've made sure to do it. Should be in the Hall of Fame. So the next day, the Royals come into town. And uh, game one, they, too, tie it up in the eighth inning. But again, that guy, MVP Miguel Tejada, with the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth. It would be fitting if he would end the game again. Tejada up the middle. The ends have won 19 in a row. MVP. Two walk-offs in a row to keep this thing going. You're like, it can't get any better than that. Yeah, it was, I just remember being like completely amazed because their backs were to the wall a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, you're like, okay, well, I mean, the streak's got to end at some point. And then when they give up leads late, just yes. to, to have these late inning heroics. So 19 wins in a row. The next day, they jump out to 11 to nothing lead through three innings against the Royals. You're thinking, all right, well, 20's in the bag. Let's look forward to 21. But the Royals fight back. They tie the game with two outs in the ninth inning. Bottom of the ninth inning, pinch hitting for Eric Burns. Wazoo alum Scott Hatterberg comes up. And if you've seen Moneyball, you you obviously know what's going to happen. Next. Immortalized by Chris Pratt. Yes. Now the pitch. Swung on. There's a high drive. Hit way back. Right center field. That one is gone. And it's pretty consecutive victories for the Oakland Athletics on an unbelievable night when they lost an 11 to nothing lead. And now they win it. Hatterberg is mobbed at home plate. The crowd comes back to insane life. So, I, first of all, I, I was prepping for this, watching the interview with Scott Hatterberg, and he was very impressed with Chris Pratt's athletic ability because Hatterberg's a lefty, and Chris Pratt is not. But he still worked through and looked pretty decent out there. He did, he did. But uh, now I had heard, and I think we'd even talked about this before, that Hatterberg hit that home run with a bat that he wasn't supposed to be using. He was a Louisville slugger. He was uh, Louisville Slade signed with Louisville Slugger, but he used a different bat to hit that home run. And from what I had heard, and I think I had, again, I think I talked about this. I thought he got fined by Louisville Slugger for not using his contracted bat for using another company's bat in this big home run as he would have been fined if he would have just used it at any point without using the bat he was supposed to. But I read some articles here getting ready for this, and what I read about is that it, he didn't get fined by Louisville Slugger. He actually got fined by the Hall of Fame <laughs> oh, <laughs> because wow. the Hall of Fame wanted the bat. So he gave them a Louisville Slugger, which he didn't use. Oh, wow. And he kept the actual bat in an acrylic frame at his, at his house on his mantle. And the Hall of Fame found out about this and sent him the bat back that he had sent them and was not happy. But he still has the bat that he used in his house, I guess, apparently. Wow. So, <laughs> but he, he said that this bat was by a company. I don't even know. Because you've got to be, like, approved as a bat company to have your right. bat used in a, in a major league game. And it sounds to me like this bat might not have been. Which would be another reason he might not want to send it to the Hall of Fame. But what are they going to do now? But anyway, another thing. I love this one. Dallas Braden's perfect game. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love this story, not just because it happened on Mother's Day or I've gotten to know Dallas. But I think this goes to show how a team connects with your life when you're a fan. So this happened and we were living in Arizona when it happened and I was watching this game because I watch every game on TV 
And we had to go to my mom's house to pick her up because we were taking her out to dinner for Mother's Day. And it's getting closer and closer later in the game. And it, he's still got this perfect game going. And I'm not happy that I'm now going to have to get in the car. But call up the, the game on my phone. And we're listening to it as we get closer to my mom's house. And I started to slow down because I didn't want to get there before the game was over. <laughs> but uh, especially with a perfect game, I just didn't want to miss this. Then, as it happens, my wife also got to share in this for the last couple of innings of that game, listening to it in the car. And she remembers it very vividly and how excited I got. And what is great is Dallas loves to hear these stories. He loves to hear how pe how people tell him they consumed his perfect game, which is really cool. But here is the here's the final out of, of Dallas Braden's perfect game. Two out, nobody on, ninth inning. Bartlett's on deck, and Braden turns. He throws, and it's swung on a ground ball to short. Taken there, Pennington's got it. He throws a perfect game! Dallas Braden has thrown a perfect game! The A's have beaten Tampa Bay 4-0. The kid from Stockton has done it for the A's! Uh, you know, Dallas Braden is from Stockton, as he as Kent Korak there just said. Been an A's fan his entire life. Grew up with pictures of Tim Hudson and the big three in his in his room and got to play for his childhood favorite team. His grandmother was there on Mother's Day. His mother had passed away from cancer while he was in high school. And his grandmother took over after that and is a very special person in his life. And he was she was there for this Mother's Day game, which he says he pitched with a hangover, a pretty bad hangover. <laughs> he says uh, he had one great day at work and it made the rest of his life, which is a pretty Dallas Braden thing to say. Unique, but accurate. Yes. <laughs> also, Dallas Braden, of course, is the uh, get off my mound guy that he shouted at A-Rod. He does not like A-Rod, like legitimately does not like A-Rod. He and Jose Canseco, they, they do not like, <laughs> legitimately do not like A-Rod. But uh, that was a, a great thing. And like I said, Dallas got really choked up a couple of times during this last, last couple of games as an A's fan, which got me as well. Speaking of no hitters and perfect games, at the Coliseum, three perfect games were thrown and 12 no-hitters. Jim Catfish Hunter, the first perfect game in the uh, Coliseum's history. No video evidence of this. They, this really? 1968, the game was not televised. But wow. there's just audio. Vita Blue uh, then had one. Uh, Jim Bibby for the Texas Rangers. No hit the A's in 1973. There was a combined one by Oakland against California in 1975 with Vita Blue, Glenn Abbott, Paul Lindblad, and then Raleigh Fingers came in to, uh, to finish it up. John Blue Moon Odom and uh, Francisco Barrios combined with one against the A's. Uh, that, that confused me because Blue Moon Odom, you know, pitched for the A's, but... They uh, threw a no-hitter against the A's and won 2-1. to one. So the A's got a run, even though they were no-hit. Mike Warren for the A's in 1983. Some guy named Nolan Ryan for the Rangers in 1990 mm. threw a no-hitter. I remember that. Yeah, did, uh, probably he's only one. I've never really yeah, heard of him. Yeah, you only throw one, you know. <laughs> His sixth of seven. Oh, wow, I guess, that, I guess I was wrong. Hmm. The Orioles threw a no-hitter against the A's. Bob Malacky, Mike Flanagan, Mark Williamson, and Greg Olson in 1991. And that was the last one against the A's. I mean, for a very long time. That was the longest streak in baseball until last season. But we'll get to that. The aforementioned Dallas Braden perfect game in 2010. Sean Manaya threw a no-hitter against the Red Sox in 2018. And then the next year, Mike Fires threw a no-hitter against the Reds. And then last year, Domingo Herman with the Yankees threw a perfect game against the A's and broke that no-hitter streak that had been uh, going on since 1991. Some award winners for the A's while here in Oakland. Seven MVPs, five Cy Youngs, and seven Rookie of the Year awards. So... MVPs while here in Oakland, Vita Blue in 71, Reggie Jackson in 1973, Jose Canseco in 88, Ricky Henderson in 1990, Dennis Eckersley in 1992, MVP as a closer. 
That's an accomplishment right there. That, that was an amazing, amazing oh, He was just, I mean, he came in and you might as well just end the game. He was not going to, I mean, I think his ERA was under one. It was. Yeah. When, when you don't pitch a lot of innings, if you have one bad outing, your ERA could be. That's right. You know, four plus for the rest of the season, no matter how good you are. But yeah, Jason Giambi in 2000 and then Miguel Tejada in 2002. Cy Young Awards here in Oakland. Vita Blue in 71. Catfish Hunter in 74. Go-Go's Muse Bob Welch in 1990. Not sure he deserved that. I don't think he was the best pitcher on the A squad that year. But he won 27 games. Yeah, he won 27 games, which nobody had done in a very long time. Uh, but I think that was Stu's, like, third consecutive year of winning 20-plus games. Right. <laughs> Dennis Eckersley, beyond winning the MVP in 1992, also won the Cy Young Award. That would be weird if you won the MVP as a pitcher and didn't win the Cy Young Award. Yeah, I can't see that happening. <laughs> and then Barry Zito in 2002 was the last Oakland Athletic to win the Cy Young. Rookies of the Year here in Oakland. What a streak. Three years in a row. The A's like to do things in, in groups of three. Uh, 1986, Jose Canseco, 87, Mark McGuire, 1988, Walt Weiss. Then Ben Grieve in 1990. I remember Ben Grieve. <laughs> Didn't do a whole lot after that. Bobby Crosby, Bones in 2004. Then Houston Street the next year in 2005. And then Andrew Bailey in 2009. Want to talk about 4040, Jose Canseco, the first member of the 4040 Club in 1988. Since then, Barry Bonds, Alfonso Soriano, Ronald Acuna Jr., A-Rod, and now Shohei Otani, who is just, I mean, into a different stratosphere than 40-40. Yes. But uh, those are A's players that uh, went 40-40. I didn't know this. Eric Thames, who I think he did play for the A's in the minors. I don't think they ever called him up. But he was the first player to reach 40 home runs and 40 stolen bases in a season in the KBO. I didn't oh, know wow. that. And nobody has ever done it in, in the MPB, in the Japanese League. Never been done. And how about the Bash Brothers? I mean, when you talk about the Oakland A's, the Bash Brothers, you've got to talk about, right? we have I've mentioned them several times before. Canseco and McGuire, the main culprits there. But, I mean, you had Dave Henderson. You had Dave Parker. You had Steiny hit 30-plus in one year. Carney didn't really hit a whole lot of home runs, but they had some some big guys came up with that forearm bash, which people are still doing today. They still do. Absolutely. I saw it recently. Yeah. I'm always concerned people are going to like break their forearm when they get too excited. <laughs> Not a lot of meat there. Yeah. I, I, I always well, think about that. I guess with Ms., uh, McGuire and Canseco, they were so roided up that their forearms were huge. So I guess they didn't have to worry about it. I guess we've got to talk about steroids. If you talk about the A's, Mac and Canseco, the Giambis, both of them, Bartolo Colon, probably Frank Thomas, Troy Neal, Miguel Tejada. There are a lot of guys on the A's that, like the the clear and the all the other stuff, for better or worse. I mean, it was legal when they started, but uh, still a lot of them. Uh, I mentioned Reggie Jackson. It's kind of hard to mention Oakland A's baseball and not talk about Reggie Jackson. Probably the most feared home run hitter in the nineteen seventies. He hit two hundred ninety two in that decade, five hundred sixty three for his career. Part of those A's teams in the early seventies that won uh, the three back to back to back World Series. Obviously went on to a pretty good career in New York and Baltimore and California and eventually back to Oakland. If we've got to talk about owners, I guess so. Uh, Charlie Finley, the first in a long line of bad, bad owners in Oakland. (laughs) Uh, Charlie was uh, unique. Yeah. is one way to put it. He was the guy that moved them from Kansas City to Oakland. So I guess there's that. Uh, His players hated him. You know, he was cheap. Once free agency came about, the players all wanted out and got out of here as soon as possible. They didn't want to deal with him. I don't blame him. Charlie was like us, though, Mark. He had a lot of ideas, just not a lot of good ideas. Right. (laughs) He had the the yellow baseball. It was easier to see it. He wanted designated runners. He took up a roster spot for one. So, yeah, a a lot of ideas. Not a lot of them stuck. Let's talk about some pop culture stuff. How about MC Hammer? There you go. Bat Boy and Executive Vice President of the team from 1973 through 1980. 
He was nicknamed Hammer because the players thought he looked a lot like Henry Aaron, who was <clears throat> obviously nicknamed the Hammer. Also named Pipeline. We, I think we've talked about this because he was essentially Charlie Finley's ears in the clubhouse. It's not a positive nickname. Anything was said in the clubhouse and Charlie Finley would hear about it through through Hammer. Hmm. <laughs> Remember in the late 80s, though, hip hop culture, everybody was either wearing a University of Miami hat or jacket or an A's one. And uh, of course, a couple of A's players, one of which was Ricky Henderson, gave Stanley Burrell some money to go make a demo and uh, thusly become the... I mean, he was huge when he was MC Hammer for a year or two. He was like, he was music. He he dominated. Yeah. And then his second album, it contained the Too Legit to Quit single. Yes. Which is a great video with a bunch of athletes, including one Ricky Henderson doing the, the Too Legit to Quit hand thing which gives me anxiety to try and do it quickly (laughs) also freaking richard marx was even on he acted out a world series game against the a's in the coliseum wearing cubs home uniforms he's a cubs fan and this fever dream i guess for this video he and his bandmates are the cubs playing the a's in the oakland coliseum but the the cubs the home team and richard marx hits a home run to win the world series off of dennis eckersley which i mean we That's just discussed so he, realistic he won the mvp in the cy young in the same year yeah i but, think richard marx is about three foot seven yeah too. he's not a big guy but, <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you, Richard Marks uh, helped me uh, helped me in high school with uh, with the ladies. So, <laughs> tip Attaboy. of the cap to you, sir. Debbie Fields, you who's Debbie Fields? Maybe you know better as Mrs. Fields from Mrs. Fields Cookies. Mm-hmm. She was a ball girl for the A's for quite some well, time. No, I did not know that. Yeah. So that's cool. That's pretty good. We've talked about owners. I, I do want to mention Walter Haas. He was the good owner. <laughs> he was the owner during the late 80s that would spend money and wanted the team to succeed. He was a Bay Area guy. After Haas, it was Stephen Scott and, or I'm sorry, Stephen Schott and Ken Hoffman, who they were so cheap. They are who forced GM Billy Bean to adopt the money ball approach. That's right. Lou Wolf. Bought the team after that. He was allowed to buy the team because he was frat brothers with Bud Selig. And then uh, he sold it without taking any other offers to the current idiot in charge because of the good old boy network of of owners. And I don't want to talk about that. But uh, tip of the cap to the Haas family, at least. There you go. (laughs) I want to talk about the the 2012, Mark. The Texas Rangers and the Oakland A's, they were fighting it out for the AL West. And this is, I'm not sure if I've told this story. I might have, but we're talking about the A's. I was in Dallas. Uh, I was getting ready to leave, having worked a Cowboys game. And the A's were playing the, the Rangers. They were hosting the Rangers in this final game of the season, winner take all. And so I'm listening to the game on my phone as I'm getting on the plane. There was no internet on the plane at this point. So I literally left it on through takeoff, which you weren't supposed to do. And I kept listening to it until we got too high in the air and I lost the the feed. But as soon as we landed, and I was living in Seattle at this point, as soon as we landed, turn on the phone and go and look at the score. And I see that they have won the game. And I am so excited. And the Mariners are playing at home their final game of the season i get in the car and take off from the airport and go directly to the stadium where i had teased greg who is in charge of these kind of things for the mariners they have the standings flags out in left field and at one point earlier they had the a's in the wrong order because they were tied but they had a better winning percentage so they should have been a front and I brought this up to him and he made the change and so I wasn't working that day but I came and stopped at T-Mobile for the final few innings of, of the game I don't remember if you were working it or not but uh, when I got there I was told the story of them reordering the flags once that game went final to show that the A's uh, had clinched the AL West, and that made me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's a good memory I, I will definitely always have. 
Let's talk about leaders at the Coliseum. Uh, and not so much A's, A's leaders, because if you you look at home runs in the Coliseum, you've got the guys you expect. I mean, they're all going to be A's guys, right? Because he play most of the games there. You got McGuire and, and Reggie Jackson, Jose Canseco, Eric Chavez, and Jason Giambi. Those are the top five home run hitters at the Coliseum. But I wanted to find people that hadn't played uh, for the A's, because you've got guys like Dwayne Murphy and Matt Stairs and Tony Armas here who hit a lot of home runs in the Coliseum, but they also played for other teams. So you've got to go all the way down to number 65 on this list of most home runs in the Coliseum for guys that did not play with the A's at any point. And it's A-Rod with 21 home runs and also Mike Trout with 21 home runs. So those are the two guys that hit the most home runs in the Oakland Coliseum that never played for the A's at all. That's going to stand forever. Mike Trout and uh, and A Rod. Yeah, so. yeah. Two pretty good players. Yeah, they're. I mean, one of them I like. Right, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to get to uh, this. So well, we talked about Moneyball a little bit, right? That's what kind of made. That's what gave everybody maybe their first insight to the Oakland A's and kind of how they're always the underdogs. I mean, it's a great baseball movie. It's, it's, there's a lot of artistic Liberty that was, was made in the movie. Uh, If you want to read the book, that's going to give you a, probably a a closer idea. But the fact that Tim Hudson, Barry Zito and Mark Mulder are barely mentioned and never seen in, in Moneyball kind of tells you that they're not giving you the whole story. But they do a great job of representing that streak that we talked about earlier. I want to talk about also Billy Ball. And this might be something that if you're not an A's fan, you might not be as familiar with. But in the early 80s, when Ricky Henderson was a young player, Billy Ball was the thing. And that was when Billy Martin was managing the A's. Very similar to, I guess they called it Whitey Ball in in St. Louis. Uh, yeah, around yeah. the same time, where Vince Coleman and and Willie yeah. McGee and I remember Billy Ball. I remember being a fan. That's how they marketed the A's here locally. And I remember I had posters and bumper stickers in my room as a youth of Billy Ball. And I really wish I still had them because one, Ricky Henderson was on them, but they were just great posters. But there has been a jingle that has been in my brain. Forever since I was seven, eight years old, and I finally found a small clip of it on the internet. If anybody can find more of this, like the whole thing, I would appreciate it. But this is the uh, kind of the jingle that the A's used to highlight Billy Martin and Billy Ball for the A's. is everybody always picking on me so that's too if you know the song charlie brown which i don't know who sings it that's what that's too but that song i probably sing in my head once a day (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) but yeah billy martin in those a's commercials from that time actually made fun of himself quite a bit i guess like he did in the miller light commercials too yeah so Got that going for him. Last thing I wanted to talk about, Mark, was uh, something that I've brought up that's very important to me the last couple of years is A's Fantasy Camp. Sure. I've gotten to to tell a lot of stories from these players, some of which we've talked about here today, that I've gotten to know personally. I, I can't even tell you how cool it is that I get texts from Dave Stewart. I mean, right. <laughs> that's just, just like that makes a month when I get a text from from Stu. That'll make my month like my wife Absolutely. will come home and I'll be in a great mood. She's like, what happened? And I'm like, Stu texted me. And she's like, oh, God. <laughs> uh, you know, Dallas, Dallas Braden, knowing who I am and recognizing me and uh, Terry Steinbach just ragging on me whenever he sees me. I love this stuff. But everybody that is involved with the A's camp was let go Monday. Just like most A's employees, they knew that they were going to be let go as soon as the regular season ended because this front office is just atrocious. So I have not heard anything. They've got a lot of my money (laughs) for Uh next uh, for 
you know, January. Nobody knows if there's going to be a fantasy camp. I don't even know if I want to go. Um, sure. Tim Hudson had already been announced as the headliner, which I was excited about. But Stu and Dallas have both said that they have nobody has talked to them about fantasy camp and they are always there. So mm. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And just another part of just ripping my heart out is the, the chance to not go hang out with some of my favorite players and just some friends that are incredible that I've made over the last couple of years there. So that's equally depressing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, is there anything you want to bring up, Mark, about the A's? Obviously, you know, you were a part of the franchise for a while in the minor leagues, and you've seen a lot of A's games working for the Mariners and, and being in the AL West. But anything that you want to likewise bring up about the former Oakland Athletics? Well, you know, the... As a Mariners guy, back then, I was not such a Mariners guy. I worked for the A's organization, and so the A's were my favorite team. Those were some great years uh, working in the clubhouse, getting to know a few of these guys, some guys coming down on rehab, and um, just uh, everybody was really cool. I, I don't remember anybody being someone that I didn't enjoy the company of and uh, a lot of a lot of guys that just absolutely played they loved the game and that's why they played guys who never got to taste the big leagues but were you know triple a players but they were playing for the love of the game it was uh, it was a fun time in my life looking back at it and uh, knowing that some of these guys that i got to to work with made it to the big leagues some of them got to play in uh, World Series and playoffs and, and lots of cool things like that. I think of uh, some guys, Todd Burns, uh, one of my favorite and, and a dear friend of mine, Terry Steinbach, who was, he didn't play for Tacoma, but I did get to know him a little bit through Todd. And some of the other names, um, I think of uh, Blankenship. Yep, Lance, my boy, number 12. Number 12, and uh, just... Those were some great times uh, in, in my life. I was a lot younger then, and uh, baseball was a, as important to me then as it is now. And so the A's were a, a huge, huge part of my learning to love baseball, uh, even more than I did prior to that. And uh, I just am uh, grateful to have been a member, at least at, in some manner, of the Oakland Athletics organization. And during like one of their just heydays too in the late 80s. Oh yeah. You saw some players that came up and were playing in the big leagues in front of 60,000 people. Yeah. And I remember Hindu coming down to rehab. He was super cool. And so to this day, you know, as a Mariners guy, uh, obviously I work for the Mariners and, and they're my favorite team, but um, the A's will always, always have a special place in my heart in the game of baseball. I was saving this speaking of the Mariners. I mean, this is, not an A's highlight, but it's something that happened against the A's that owns a spot in my brain just because it was an incredible play. And also it happened against my guys. So that's how I know I've been playing the A's broadcast of this stuff. I'm going to I'm going to play the Mariners side of this one and the great Dave Niehaus because he had just a great call on this game from 2001. At the beginning of the season in 2001, when this is when Ichiro kind of planted his flag in Major League Baseball and yes. showed everybody what he can do defensively. Terrence Long is lead over at first. Here comes a 3-2 pitch on the way. Swung on and a ground ball punched into right field for a base hit. So heading to third base is Long. The throw to third base. And they've got him nailed at third base on a tremendous throw by Ichiro. I'm here to tell you that Ichiro threw something out of Star Wars down there at third base. He fired a shot about three feet off the ground all the way on the fly to David Bell. And Terrence Long was D-O-A. <laughs> it's just such a great call. Straight out of Star Wars. T Long is D O A. Oh, just uh Yeah, legendary that's... call by by the great Dave Neehouse. Yeah. So those are those are some of the things that I wanted to touch about my favorite team. And I know we've got listeners that everybody's got their favorite team. 
I think most of our listeners are probably as invested in their favorite team as as I have been with the A's as long, maybe even longer. I mean, it's been 40 plus years. I have been a diehard Oakland Athletics fan going to games as a as a child, going to games this year. I, I hope nobody else ever relocates. I really do. Uh, I've gone through this twice with two very important teams, but this is by far the most important thing uh, in, in my life in terms of a, a team leaving, and it's been really hard. I really do appreciate everybody that reached out uh, to me about this. I am also just baffled at the people on the Internet that seem to just take joy in people's suffering you know, that that you lose your team and you deserve it. Or that are bootlickers for the owners, which yeah. every single owner approved of this. I mean, it just, I, I don't get it. But yeah, people like to see other people miserable, I guess. I guess so. And it, it, it is for someone who loves baseball as much as you, and I respect that a ton. I can't imagine anything more difficult to deal with as far as baseball. So, um, you know, my heart goes out to you and all those other Oakland fans. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a diehard ace fan, but I, I know how much it's got to hurt and how, uh, how rough that must be. And my heart goes out to all of you. Uh, anybody listening, that's an ace fan as well. Uh, I, I really feel bad for you and that is legitimate. I wish it wasn't happening. Um, but it is something unfortunate that we have to deal with. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a very sad day. I, I speak for all A's fans. I'm sure when I say, I appreciate that. And, you know, for the most part, I think 95% of people know why this happened. The other 5% want to blame fans, but you know, I'm mm-hmm. sure they, they don't really, no, nor care what happened. But I, I've been thinking about this. You know, I when Ricky Henderson was winding down his career, I remember thinking to myself, you know, what is baseball going to be like for me when Ricky retires and is not playing anymore? Because regardless of whatever team he was on, I, I paid attention and I watched all their games because I wanted to see my favorite player play, even if it wasn't any longer with my favorite team. And once he did retire, I, I found that baseball, my consumption of baseball wasn't affected, really. It, yeah. I, I still, to this day, I'm watching two or three playoff wild card days. I'm obviously watching four games a day. But I mean, during the regular season, I generally watch two to three baseball games a day. I love it. I'm, I'm yeah. passionate about baseball. And, and I know I've heard a lot of Ace fans talking about this. I don't know what next year is going to be like. I've got the Mets. I do enjoy the Mets. I really love the Mets, but they're not the A's. I'm never going to love them as much as I do the Oakland Athletics. I don't know if I'm even going to pay attention to Sacramento. I tend to believe I probably will still watch them in Sacramento. If they let Dallas go, I don't know if I will. If they ever move to Las Vegas, which again, I don't think they ever will, I would definitely not support them and or pay attention to them, but I just don't know what next year is going to look like. Well, baseball's in your blood, man. It it is. And uh, I appreciate everybody letting me indulge myself in this episode and just talking about the A's and, and some of my memories and and my favorite things of the A's because we have run kind of long with this. We're going to, we're going to out of respect for Oakland. Also, we're going to, we're going to not have a wax packs heroes today. I think next next week when we play it, though, Mark, we, I talked to you about some special rules. We'll we'll play one week with some special rules for the A's out of respect next week. But absolutely for for this episode, I think we're going to we're going to call it here. I got through it without tearing up, which is something I was expecting to. Even when I was writing all this stuff, I was tearing up. So I'm glad that I was able to not get through this without sniffling and sn- and all that kind of stuff but i appreciate everybody letting me indulge with this and uh r.i.p to the oakland athletics my literally if not my favorite thing in the world one of my top one or two so sad day but uh Here. thank you and mark thank you for for your thoughts on the a's and memories and condolences and, and i really do appreciate that you bet 
All right, so that'll do it for this episode of Two Strike Noise. If you want more of us, you can find us on the internet. Uh, just uh, search for Two Strike Noise. That is at TWO Strike Noise. Also look in the show notes if you want to. There are all some links there for all of that as well, including our email address, Mark. Yeah, you can re- reach us at uh, Two Strike Noise. Spell it out, TWO Strike Noise at gmail.com. All right. That'll do it for this episode. We'll see you again on the next episode of Two Strike Noise. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great day.